Then we can start. So uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back. So this is a uh, week two out of three for unit one. So this week, we're going to be covering some uh, basic investment strategies. So as you may already know, I'm Ryan Wang. I'm a rising junior at Green Hills, a school in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And I started getting interested in economics and finance when I was in around ninth grade, I believe. However, my school, like a lot of other different schools across the country, do not provide in-depth courses on these important topics. So I thought I'd try and help spread the knowledge. So that's what this organization is all about. Um, we hope that through this program, you'll learn all a little, you'll learn a little bit more about um, finance and investing. I think that it is also our goal that um, you start realizing the importance of these three key tenants for securing your future financially. So uh, fiscal responsibility, money management, and financial literacy. Uh, joining alongside me today are some of my friends from Ann Arbor, uh, Grand Rapids, and the University of Michigan. Uh, they worked alongside me to develop the program and its content, and some of them will also be presenting today. So you may have already met some of them, but uh, for convenience sake, we'll all introduce ourselves again. So uh, yeah, Richard. Hello, yep. Yeah. Uh, sorry. You good there, Richard? Sorry, give me a moment. No worries. Yep, hello guys. Uh, yep, my name is Richard. I am a junior at the University of Michigan. Uh, my background is in finance and I have experiences working in venture capital and, and, and working at Daimler as a financial accountant. But uh, yeah, and I'm glad to be here to, to help out. Hello, my name is Edwin. I'm a rising senior at Green Hill School. And this, uh, recently for fun, I've been running. Hello, my name is Eka Motwani and I'm a rising so senior at Forest Hills Northern High School. And I'm excited to share my information with you from my knowledge of investing and finance. My name is Nico, and I'm a rising junior at Green Hills. All right, so um, let's move ahead here. So, let's see. Yeah, just to review the program orientation from last week, uh, we have it currently designed so there are, there are four units, each lasting about two to three weeks. However, based on the feedback that we get from you all, um, we'll figure out what, sh what, what, what we should prioritize first and when we should wrap up. So if you have any ideas, concerns, or grievances, it's imperative that you fill out the feedback form so that um, we can better adjust and accommodate for you. So these feedback forms are gonna be sent out at the end of each session. So um, let's take a look here. Last week, uh, we started looking at the basics of the stock market. Um, we first touched on what stocks really are, just little shares of ownership of a company. We also talked about um, why companies may wanna go public and issue stock. It's to raise capital, which can be used to grow the company and finance its projects. Then we touched on why we as average people should care about investing and how it can provide for your future. And finally, uh, we went over what stock prices represent and why they rise and fall over time. So at the end, I introduced you all to the stock market game and some basic mechanics. Uh, towards the end of this meeting today, um, we'll touch on that again. So until then, let's, let's uh, start today's lesson. So uh, risk and reward. Uh, there's this fundamental idea in finance that I'm sure that many of you have heard of, high risk, high reward. Uh, what this means is that when it comes to investing, risk and reward are positively correlated. Looking at the graphical representation here, as risk goes up, so does your reward or return. And as risk goes down, so does your reward. So you can't have a reasonable payoff from your investment without taking on some risk. Unfortunately, our evolved minds uh, work against, uh, work, kind of work against us here. Um, us humans have grown to stray away from risk as much as possible, favoring security and stability. And... Uh, the result of this is this concept called um, loss aversion. So loss aversion is this concept in cognitive uh, psychology and behavioral economics that refers to people's tendency to prefer avoiding losses to acquiring uh, equivalent gains. One example of loss aversion is this. Say you have $10, a $10 bill on you. Uh, now, are you going to feel more strongly if you came upon another, another $10 bill on the street? Or are you going to feel more strongly if the wind picks up and suddenly whisks your original $10 away? So 
the scenario here is which you feel more strongly about. And uh, type in the chat which one you think it is. All right, so the correct answer, well, mo most people would think that, yeah, losing $10 would, um, people would feel more strongly about that because um, this, this is the concept of loss aversion where uh, it's better to lose $10, it's better to not lose $10 than to find $10. So um, that might be a confu bit confusing, but um, basically the idea is, would you rather keep your money or would you rather try to get more but have the have the probability of losing what you already have and um loss aversion is basically saying that you know um people would rather keep their money so uh to better understand risk we should probably define it first um in a financial context risk is the possibility of loss so in investing risk is our exposure to possibly losing money our investments or even just receiving a reward less than our expected return so different financial assets have different risks. So for example, a savings account at a bank where you may deposit money earns an interest that grows your savings over time. However, the interest rate is sometimes low enough that it cannot keep up with the inflation. Uh, inflation is just like the, de de the devaluation of money. Um, because of the low risk, there is low return. On the other hand, stocks are much more risky compared to savings accounts. So as we touched on last week, stock prices change a lot. So the major fluctuations in price also known as volatility, is often used as an indicator of how risky the investment is. However, as some of you may have discovered on your own this week, uh, the reward in investing in stocks can be quite high. Uh, so this kind of demonstrates the positive correlation between risk and reward. So savings account, low risk, low reward. Uh, a stock, high risk, high reward. Um, is there any questions at this point? All right, moving ahead. Um, Actually, yeah. So there are two overarching types of risks you have to understand when investing. Uh, the, first, the first type is called systemic risk. This type of risk refers to broader trends that affect the overall financial system, uh, recessions and economic downturns like the one we, we are currently in due to the COVID-19 crisis is a really good example of uh, systemic risk um, that may befall your investments. And the second type is uh, idiosyncratic risk. So this type of risk refers to the company or industry specific factors. Uh, this type of risk is irregular and really difficult to predict, um, but unlike systemic risk, uh, it can be mitigated. So like it can be reduced. So how do you reduce um, idiosyncratic risk? Well, one way to reduce this kind of risk is through diversification. So in essence, diversification is a strategy that reduces risk exposure by adding a wide variety of financial assets to your investment portfolio. By holding positions in different companies from different industries and backgrounds, uh, the losses from one particular company will be smoothed out by the others. So here's an example. Um, if you were to hold shares in a car company, an ice cream producer, a supermarket retailer, and a pharmaceutical corporation, then an incident that may affect one of your holdings, such as, your, uh, such as the car company uh, being indicted in a false advertising scandal, then the losses you feel from the car company will be reduced by your overall diverse portfolio. So um, Maybe the ice cream producer that you invest in had a really good quarterly, uh, quarterly uh, earnings report, better than anyone expected. So then the positive performance of the ice cream producer helps neutralize the losses felt by the car company. Uh, this is the power of diversification. And of course, this is a really simplified, it's a really simplified model. But um, in the real world, investment portfolios would have at least you know, 15 to 20 different holdings with different asset classes, not just corporate stocks like this example. However, the principal idea of uh, diversification still stands. So this is definitely something to keep in mind for the stock market game. Any questions? All right, um, now I'll pass it over to Ikum. Okay, so in unit one, we're gonna cover the four basic investing strategies that you can employ in the stock market. Value investing, growth investing, momentum investing, and dollar cost averaging. We'll first cover value and growth investing today and leave the other two for next week. A lot of you were asking me about the companies to invest in and how much money to put in. As we go over these four basic strategies, I hope some of your questions will be answered. So let's first talk about value investing. So when you think of value investing, what comes to your mind? What comes to your mind? Is it buying a company that has gone down in price? Is it taking advantage of dirt cheap stocks? 
people have many definitions for value investing, but at its core, it is simply buy a company that is undervalued by others, buying $1 for 50 cents. Say you're at a garage sale and you see a new pair of Nike shoes on sale for $20. You, a high school student, knows that this is a good brand and you check the product and the quality is absolutely brand new. Type in the chat of how much you think this pair of Nike shoes should be worth. So, okay, so looking at the prices, it's worth at least $100. As a value investor, you you buy it and then resell it or keep it for yourself. The same can be said for businesses. One, you know something others don't, and two, you know the intrinsic value is higher than the market value. Now let's talk about growth investing. Opposite of buy low, sell high, buy high, and buy more where it's going higher. <laughs> Jokes aside, growth investing is focusing on companies that are growing fast. They are growing at 15 to 20% annually. Today, these companies are really hot. People are spending $1,000 for something worth $1. What makes it really difficult to invest in these companies is the inability to forecast their growth. You don't know if these companies will continue growing 20% next year or flop and only grow 1%. Key things to, to find is whether these companies have some sort of moat or defensibility, where these comp competitors can't beat them, and whether or not these companies can continue to grow in the future. Quick math could help you figure out future growth. Many strategic investors saw, saw future strong potential in some of today's leading firms. Take Apple, for example. If you invested $100 in Apple when it was went public in 1980, your investment would be worth over $90,000 today. Growth investing involves projection of future growth and using combination of projecting cash flows and understanding why this firm will succeed over its competitors. Many early tech firms which competed with Apple ended up collapsing, going under, but Apple emerged as a global leader, demonstrating the potential risk and reward of growth investing. Value versus growth investing, in short, value investing involves investing in stock trading, below their perceived fundamental value, while growth investing involves forward focus investing with a focus on leveraging future potential. All right, so uh, we just kind of went over um, value investing and growth investing, um, really like, we really simplified it. So do you guys have any questions about, um, about these two strategies and how you might want to employ them? All right, well, moving ahead. Um, next, we actually have a really important, a really uh, special speaker here today with us, uh, Andy Vance. He's a financial and strategy executive uh, at Ford Motor Company. And you know he, he has garnered a lot of experience in corporate finance and investing. And I guess he'll kind of talk about his experience and what he's learned. So, thank you, Andy. Yeah, I, so hi, everybody. Um, let, let me first, just just um, begin by commending right um, Brian you and your team right for what you're what you've put together here right I mean both in, in its concept and the actual materials and, and what you're going through um, and, and equally to all of you participants on the line um, yeah I real real feel very very proud of all of you right I mean you're doing the right things by learning about these principles early and so your your initiative and and participating is, is wonderful, right? I wish I would have had these opportunities, right? When I was back back in your age. So kudos to you all. Um, so as, as Brian said, I've, I've retired from Ford Motor Company a couple of years ago after over 30 years in, in different finance and strategy roles. Um, after um, studying finance um, in uh, undergrad and in a business school. Um, so my, my experience has been primarily from a corporate standpoint, not, um, but equally so, right? I've always had a very long fervent interest um, from a personal investment standpoint. Um, and, and the principles that, that the guys have begun to outline will continue, I'm sure, through the, through the, present to, through the next few weeks of the course itself are absolutely, right, bedrock principles, whether it be in personal investing or corporate investing. I mean, the, the risk versus reward trade-offs, right, that they discussed, the long-term, short-term perspectives, um, the systemic risk, the idiosyncratic risk. I mean, all those principles apply in different ways from a corporate standpoint, just as they do in your personal investing. Um, and I guess I'll, I'll, I'll touch a bit about each of those, right, as I kind of talk about perhaps some 
um, experiences or some of the things that, that I was involved in on the corporate end, just to kind of help you further kind of cement these into your thinking. Um, you know, my experience and what I'm going to talk about mostly is, is around capital allocation, um, which is the same thing. It's, it's spending the company's money as it's spending on your own personal money, right? Um, but when you, when you think about the company's money and treat it as if it's your own money, right? The investment principles are the same. Um, you know, I was fortunate enough um, that I've worked in about 10 different countries and lived in about 10 different countries and, and tried to consistently think about these principles in each of those different environments, right? And, and each was a uniquely different environment, um, both, both Asia, European, and South African, uh, and South American environments. Um, and they all offer different dynamics and, and such, um, had different short-term versus long-term perspectives, um, and different levels of risk, um, but it was always, right, the best investments were always the ones where I sat back and really thought about how best to invest the money um, for the company's overall you know, performance objectives, right? You as individuals and a company each have your own different thresholds, your own level of risk aversion, right? Your own targets on what you're comfortable with doing. Um, and in turn, right, what your needs are, all right? And it's the balance of those things and, and wisely allocating your own personal resources in those areas is, is very efficient. Um, and, and again, I would, every all 38 people on the call right now, I'm sure all have different kind of risk tolerances um, and reward expectations, and it's finding that balance. Um, and your perspectives too, you're all, you're all far younger than me. You got a very long-term perspective. So I would encourage you, invest early, invest often, and keep these principles in mind. Um, so a, a couple, a couple of just kind of things that I'd like to share with you. Um, you know, diversification is key, um, and Ryan and the group touched on that already, and I'm sure we'll, we'll more. Um, and you know, a large company such as Ford obviously is diversified in various ways, both in terms of its product, um, car, different cars, different trucks. Um, it's becoming less diversified and focusing more on trucks than cars, um, as it sees more opportunity there. Um, and the market itself is changing, right? But it always looks for ways to how do you diversify even within a certain truck, right? A certain product line um, for, the, for the market's sake. I mean, what can you do to differentiate your product from both the competitors and offer a range of products, right? So the idea of diversification is, is key. Um, and there's, there's periods of time when trucks do well uh, and periods of time when they don't do well. And so having that buffer, right, on the car segment, SUVs, others, to kind of counter, counter provide counterbalances, right, to those downtimes is, is very critical. Um, the, co the company's also diversified geographically in a very, right, um, programmed way to, to help um, kind of balance the, both the, the systemic risks or the structural risks and the idiosyncratic risks, right? Um, you know, as the world's become more globalized and, and it's tended to trade a bit more in uniform as far as corporate performance in various countries, over time it had been very, very uncorrelated, right? One part of the world would be doing well, the part would not be doing so well, right? So it was important to have, again, a kind of diversification um, from the corporate investments, right, globally, right, to help protect against that. Um, timing's a big thing, short-term, long-term. Certain markets, right, just like certain stocks, you have to adopt a longer term, all right, time frame and time horizon, right, before you get to realize those rewards, right? Um, startup companies um, oftentimes have a much larger payoff or much longer time for payoff, right, than other companies. Um, but uh, it, it's all dependent upon your information, your study, your knowledge of the markets, right, keeping abreast. Um, so I would encourage you in, in your own thoughts from a personal investment standpoint, read, learn, ask, talk. I mean, there's, there's the fact that there are 38 of you are online right now. So you've got 37 other resources which you can pick their brains to talk about these things beyond others that you know undoubtedly you do. Read, right? Um, I, I, I've got a, just an incredible curiosity myself, right, for understanding international markets. Um, and in turn, I've kind of used though the, the corporate experience of my own personal investing as well um, in areas that I see perhaps underperforming at the time, which might be value investments. Right, it was described earlier. Um, opportunities from it from a currency standpoint, um, where markets are cheaper at some point in time, right, due to other factors. Right, again, right, um, 
diversifying those things and looking for value right across the globe has been something that I've been focused on. Um, so I, I really haven't gotten very specific on the corporate experiences, but again, I, I wanted to just kind of highlight, I mean, the similarities and whether you, from a career standpoint, go in, go into a Wall Street position, whether you do something entirely unrelated, right, to the finance industry, or go into a corporate investment standpoint, right, the principles are there, right? So keep these principles in mind, learn about them, experiment with them, right? Understand your own level of tolerance um, and your, your risk expectations, right? And you'll find that balance um, and you'll be rewarded well for it, I mean, over the course of your, your working career and beyond, right? So I, I wish, wish you all well. I'm happy to take perhaps any questions or further discuss anything that I either touched on or you, that you're curious about, right? So consider me a ready, willing, and able resource. Yeah. Well said, Andy. Um, we have a few questions for you um, from our participants. So the first one is, uh, how long did you work for Ford? I think you covered this. Yeah, it was a bit over 30 years. A bit over uh, 30 years. Yep, yep. And uh, what helped you uh, advance further in your financial career? Uh, so so I kind of want to finish up kind of talking a bit about my, my curiosity, right? I mean, it, 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 I think, you know, curiosity tends to breed an interest in learning, right? And, and I showed, right, from that interest in learning, right, um, kind of a, a good connection to how, how to apply the learnings, right? It's one thing to sit back on your own and just learn for the sake of, right, you know, feeling good about yourself. But when you're learning on things related to, again, whether it be your personal investments, whether it be markets in which the company was talking about doing. Um, and, and I was fortunate from a career standpoint to have a very early opportunity um, for an international posting. Um, and I, I think that just through that experience itself, I was able to demonstrate, right, kind of the payoff, right, of, of the learnings that I put in, the time I put in to learn more specifically about the country I was invested. I was one of the junior members of the team that was put into um, to Hungary um, when it was a, a formative company after after the wall came down um, in Russia. And so it was, you know, before most of you were born, right? Um, and the country, the company knew very little about it, um, but was encouraged by the European governments to invest in it. Um, and I was the junior guy on the team, but I knew more about the country and its history and uh, its culture and, and um, opportunities there than they did, right? Only because I learned, right? Um, and, uh, and networking, I think, allowed me to prosper a great deal, both inside the industry and outside the industry. Um, Again, I have not worked on Wall Street, but I but I had a lot of contacts on Wall Street, did some deals with Wall Street, some acquisition divestitures, um, but always tap Wall Street as well, right? To, to have the, kind of the latest and greatest learnings. And, um, you know, there's a level of sophistication there that it doesn't exist in the corporate world, but there's a high degree of sophistication from a finance standpoint in the corporate world that doesn't exist there, right? So it's, it's all about learning and being able to apply those learnings and communicate. I mean, communication's a key, right, in all your careers going forward is to, you're, you're all incredibly bright people, right? Um, you gotta communicate it, right? You gotta have other people understand it, um, tangible things. All right, yeah. Um, I mean, through um, even just running this organization and like reaching out to people like you um, really involves a lot of communication and like um, networking. Like I wouldn't have reached I wouldn't have reached you if I like had asked around, especially through Dr. Randolph and all that. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad you did, right? And and again, I'll look look for me to be a constant resource to anybody on the line, right? For well beyond just today. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a few more questions here, um, if you don't mind. Um, let me see, let me see here. So one thing that was actually asked of um, Richard last week while he was talking about his experience in business school is um, mm -hmm. why did you choose investing in finance? And um, I guess I, I could ask this for you too. Yeah. Um, so, so for me, you know, I, I've always um, had a, had a personal interest and grew up in a family, right. To put a great premium, right. Um, on investing, right. Albeit with a, a limited amount of resources, but um, I, I, I grew up as a kid, right. Um, having breakfast on my grandmother's lap while she read the Wall Street Journal, right? And this was, you know, 50 years ago, right? And so I was always exposed, right, to the concepts. Um, loved math. Um, so certainly numbers did not scare me, right, in any way, right? Um, wanted wanted to, to, to parlay whatever from a career standpoint that I had, right, um, 
in, in, into something that was meaningful um, post-career, right, which required right, the resources to do that. Um, and, and, and quickly kind of steered in, into just the whole general business area in an, from an undergrad career standpoint, um, but had a particular affinity, right, for finance and economics, um, both was good at it and enjoyed it, which obviously are kind of reinforcing things, right? Um, and just it decided coming out of graduate school um, that I was interested um, in, in pursuing, you know, finance and, and fortunately kind of a combined strategy mm-hmm. role as well. Um, and for uh, for the great opportunity, and so I right approached it with you know with a real passion. All right, um, three more questions for you. Um, so, the first one is um, going into investment and finance. Um, what kind of um, what kind of like salary could you expect? Because I feel like as of right now, as people are you know starting to get more pragmatic, I guess following the um, following this kind of recession, like people are thinking, yeah. you know, what kind of field should I go into and like, how's that going to affect my, you know, uh, financial independence down the line? So. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I am not as close to what the, the present marketplace is from a, you know, kind of career placement standpoint, Richard might have a better idea. Um, you know, I, I, I can, I, I can tell you it's far more than what I started off with in the corporate realm, the corporate realm, right. It will certainly be, Far less um, lucrative financially initially, all right? Than 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 Wall Street um, consulting and uh, you know investment banking role itself. Um, there's probably greater stability from a corporate standpoint, right? Than Wall Street. I mean, Wall Street's kind of I mean a much higher you know risk reward right kind of threshold right than the corporate side of things, right? Um, so, but but the the salary itself, all right is is on the higher end of, of, of whatever discipline probably you're going to come out of right short of medicine or high-end engineering computer engineering uh you know out of collegiate environment um so it's certainly you know more than competitive right certainly above the median right in anything to be coming out of right and, and beyond that it's 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 what you make of it right i mean you know w- wall street compensates very well the corporate environment compensates very well for those that are producing right um and the more you produce for for that respective organization, the more you're going to benefit financially, all right. And the more resources you'll have to personally invest, right, and and to, to further leverage that, right, for your own personal portfolio itself. Right? Um, so I I would encourage nobody to pursue a career for the money, um, but I would also assure you that the money is there um, in this sector, right, from a career standpoint, probably. Uh, in, in greater degrees than, than others. Um, hence, you know, some of the inequality issues and stuff that society faces right now, right? So the gap may narrow, but it will always be, um, I think a very capitalistic society in which, you know, those are perform and financial standpoint will be well rewarded. All right, um, we have uh, the last two questions here. Um, someone's asking, and someone was asking this, and actually, I was actually curious about this as well. Like, what were like, some of your most memorable or like best investments before like what was like your best decision or choice that really paid off within ford is this yeah yeah um i i think probably one that comes to mind i mean right off the bat uh, and it was both in a period that was very challenging um was uh in in thailand um and you, some of you may know about this, having read, and again, it's probably before most of you were, were, were born. Um, yeah, mid-1990s, there was an ex, this, uh, a real currency shock um, in a number of the Asian markets, right? And, and the, the Thai currency value um, essentially uh, devalued by about 75%. So imagine you know a dollar today being worth a quarter tomorrow, right? Um, and the shock it had on the economy and, and the Asian markets. And we, Ford had just gotten into Thailand, um, establishing its kind of first manufacturing operations, uh, first marketing and sales network um, about a year prior to that um, with a significant investment. Um, and it was going to be the kind of the foothold for Ford Southeast Asian environments. And with the, with the uh, currency devaluation, right? Obviously, when those you know proceeds got repatriated back to the U.S., they were worth seventy five percent less, 
right? And there was a, a, a great deal of pressure within the company, right, to just get out, right? And, and just to kind of hedge your, hedge your losses and, and get the heck out, right? It's too unstable a market. Um, and, and I believed, right, that it was far more of a, a, a structural risk, right, or systemic risk as opposed to an idiosyncratic risk that the market would come back. It was clearly unique, right, from a currency standpoint, and the markets globally would find a way to rebalance. Um, and so I, I pushed just the opposite. I pushed to invest more, right, get more aggressive, while others were retrenching to invest more, right? Um, and it's, it, proved, it proved to be very successful that once the market stabilized, right, we're in a much better position relative to the competition, right, to benefit from added product, added distribution, added networks, right? more manufacturing capacity and all the things, right? Um, to in the end, realize greater level of profits. So it's, it's the same kind of, you know, situation you face as investors, right? In, in, a, in a falling market, right? What do you do, right? Do you sell and, and hedge your losses, right? Or do you look for buying opportunities, right? To get in more, right? Is there more value there long-term? Um, so that was probably, I mean, overall, uh, I can't place a dollar value on it, but it was significant from a corporate standpoint, undoubtedly. Mm -hmm. uh, let me see here. All right. Yeah, so, I, I also found my wife in Thailand too. That was in addition to the to the one thing, right? So that made it even better. Very big investment, huge payoff. Yeah, a big investment there, right? And yeah, I think a big payoff too. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, last question here. So, um, if there's something that you kind of like want us to, one thing that we would take away from like your like biggest advice that you would give to you know future aspiring investors, um, what would it be? So, so two things, two things. One, in, get in the market, right? Invest, invest early, even if it's right with minimal resources, right? You're gonna learn from it a great deal, right? Um, and so get in, learn from it. Um, and the, the power of compound, right? Investing is, is, is huge, right? Um, and so the earlier you get in, right? Those, those returns, which all of you will, will receive over time, is only gonna grow. But the, the other big thing is just to know your, know your risk reward trade off, your threshold, right? Um, and, and just know how comfortable you are with risk um, so that you can make appropriate investments, right? I and mean, uh, I had it kind of described to me by a business school professor was, you know, most people either eat well or sleep well, right? You can eat well and live large, and, um, but you're not gonna sleep well because you're worried about the next day, right? Um, or you can sleep well being content that you've made smart investments for the long term within kind of the, th the threshold that you're comfortable with and you're willing to write out losses, don't sell into a down market, you know, um, and, and look for opportunities, always be opportunistic, always be positive. The markets return, right? Markets come back, that's been proven historically, right? There'll be rough periods over your investing career, right? But stay the course, right? Um, have a discipline, right? And a strategy, right? And keep at it, keep at it, keep at it. Learn from others too. Right? Uh, really great stuff here today, Andy. Um, thank you for coming on. Um, yeah, really appreciate it. Sure, sure. No, I'm happy to, as I said, right? Consider me a, an ongoing resource. And if there's anything that I can offer to anyone, formally or informally, right? Um, feel free to reach out to me. All right, sounds good. Thank you. Um, so, thanks, Roy. Uh, I guess we're just wrapping up the segment here. Um, and we have the Kahoot next. So, um, this Kahoot, once again, like last week, is just going to uh, encompass a lot of the material that we covered um, today and also some stuff that, you know, is just like financial trivia that you may or may not know. Some of it's easy and it's going to get harder as we go. So let's see here. Um, go to also, if you didn't know this last time, uh, to join a Kahoot game, you go to uh, Kahoot.it on your phone, or computer, whatever. And then, yeah. So. Take a look here. That's the code, and then you type it in.
All right, let's start. Um, just lower the volume here and we can begin. So 15 questions, starting with number one. Risk and reward usually have what kind of relationship? Yeah, so most of you've got it there. Um, yes, risk and reward usually have a positive relationship. So what this means is as risk goes up, so does reward, and as risk goes down, so does reward. We have Eric in the lead, followed by Anna and Drummer. Right, true or false, people tend to prefer acquiring gains rather than avoiding equivalent losses. Now, what concept is this going over? Well, this is a tricky one. Um, yeah, so people uh, tend to avoid losing. Uh, people tend to avoid losing rather than acquiring. Uh, this is the concept called loss aversion. So um, most people are going to be more risk averse. So I guess for the people who pick true, I guess you guys are more tolerable towards risk. And I mean, I'm not kind of like I'm not one of those people, but I guess you know there's always people in the world that we need who are um, more to tolerable to risk. Eric holding on to his lead and Rewin coming up. Which of these is the most risky financial asset? Yeah, most of you guys got it there. It's stocks. Definitely stocks is the most risky financial asset. Um, one indicator of risk is um, the volatility of the asset price. And, you know, as we kind of covered last week, you know, stocks, the pricing is very volatile. So. What are the two types of risk? Yeah, a little bit of a typo there. It's supposed to be st systemic, but basically the same, the same definition. But yeah, the two types of risk are systemic and idiosyncratic. Anna Banana taking, over, taking the lead over Eric. Which of these is not an example of systemic risk? All right, so a, a huge split here. So um, I guess let's take a look at each of these options. So um, the Federal Reserve raising interest rates by 1.5%. Now, this is, um, this is something that we can cover later when, if we talk about government. But basically, the Federal Reserve is the central bank of the United States. And when they raise interest rates, it applies to the entire nation. So this is something that would affect the entire economy. So that would be an example. That would be an example of a systemic risk. Um, let's see. Trade war between the U.S. and China, that would be also something that affects the entire con economy, not something, not like very company or industry specific. So that would, um, that would also be an example of systemic risk. Uh, a hurricane ravaging a large part of the East Coast. Now, I guess um, a lot of you guys might have picked this because it only affects one region. But um, once again, like a hurricane is still like a massive economic, um, economic catastrophe. Like even though it's just a even though it just lands in one part of the region, it's going to have massive repercussions throughout the entire economy. And um, we, we kind of saw this with Katrina and also Maria earlier. Um, so yeah, that would also be an example of systemic risk. Um, so 
the only example of an idiosyncratic risk would be pharmaceutical companies CEO being arrested for insider trading. This would only affect one company. So yeah, that would, that would not be systemic risk. And Ava taking the lead. How can, idios how can idiosyncratic risk be mitigated? And most of you guys got it. Um, I don't think this warrants an explanation, yeah. You uh, mitigate risk or you reduce risk, idiosyncratic risk through diversification. What style of investing is Warren Buffett known for? Most of you guys got it. Yeah. Warren Buffett with his uh, company Berkshire Hathaway is a huge value investor. So Ava holding on to her lead, followed by Anna. And I'm not going to try to pronounce that, but someone else has come up on the leaderboard taking third. You should buy a particular you should buy a particular stock if you believe its intrinsic value is what? The current price. Oh, so a huge split there. Um, yeah, the correct answer is greater than. So the intrinsic value is basically kind of the kind of the real value of the stock, not the current price. So if you believe that a particular stock is um, that its real value, its intrinsic value is greater than what the current like market price is, what like what's like being shown on the screens, then you should you should definitely buy it because you're kind of basically assuming that like the market's going to correct. And that um, the current price is going to finally reflect the intrinsic price by moving up to it. So then, that's why you that's why you'd want to buy. I guess it's kind of a con confusing concept, but you know. So growth investors tend to look for what kind of company? So, so yeah, most of you guys got it. Yeah, growth investors tend to look for small and young companies. They try to, you know, kind of look for the next big thing. So like Apple when it was rising, Netflix, and even just Zoom like a few months ago when like the pandemic hit and like people had to social distance, so they they have they had to use Zoom more. Its stock price rose uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. So. Uh, which automotive company first automated production through the assembly line? Uh, good, all of you guys got it. Yeah, Ford was the first company to do so. And it became a huge, um, very productive model that got, you know, shipped out to like basically all the other manufacturing companies in the country. All right, who is the current US Secretary of Treasury?
or yeah, most of you guys got it. Um, Steve Mnuchin is the current U.S. Secretary of Treasury. Uh, Henry Paulson was the Secretary of Treasury um, for um, Bush in his later years. Mike Pompeo is the current Secretary of State, and Mark Esper is the current Secretary of Defense. So what is the current U.S. national debt? Yeah, it is currently 26 trillion, a huge number and quite worrisome. So we'll see. Which of these American companies was a monopoly before it got broken up? I guess a lot of you guys know your history. Yes, Standard Oil was a huge monopoly on, um, on the oil industry before it finally got broken up um, in, I believe, the early 19th century. No, early 20th century, I believe. All right, what year did the stock market crash at the start of the Great Depression? Yes, it crashed in 1929 on uh, Black Monday. And it was, uh, a lot of people said it's like, that's the start of the Great Depression. And it was like, it's the, it's the cause of it. But um, I think that most economists would say that, you know, it was more of a symptom. Last question. Uh, this is a difficult one. Which economist coined the phrase irrational exuberance? Yes, so Alan Greenspan did. Um, does anyone know what he was talking about when he was describing irrational exuberance? I guess you could say it's a very niche thing. Um, so Alan Greenspan was, um, he was the chairman of the Federal Reserve for a long time, uh, from the 80s all the way to uh, the mid 2000s. Uh, what he was talking about was the housing, housing, uh, housing market, like, rising and um what is a monopoly uh okay so a monopoly is usually a, a company that has huge market share so that it has like a huge um huge power over the over the industry itself so let's say if i own if i own a company that has a monopoly on toothpaste then basically i have no competition so then i have no incentive to lower my price to compete so then basically i can raise the price of toothpaste for as much as possible. So that's why monopolies are so dangerous. And they, that's why um, there were antitrust laws that were passed to break them up. So Standard Oil was a monopoly and they had um, huge control over the US oil market. So then basically they could charge, um, they could charge uh, oil for whatever price they wanted. So oftentimes they raised it um, quite high. So that's why they were broken up. Um, so yeah. Alan Greenspan was talking about um, the housing market and how it was um, basically a bubble that finally burst in the 2007 to 2009 uh, uh, Great Recession. So it's good at the standings. All right, well done, Ava, Amanda, and Anna.
Um, yeah, no prize for you, but nice done. Uh, well done nonetheless. All right, so now we're going to move on to the stock market game. So let's see. We're back on. Okay. So just to review what we learned uh, last week about stock market investing, there are two positions that you can hold when investing in the stock market, the long position and the short position. So last week we learned that you could hold a long position when you believe that the price of, of a particular stock will appreciate in the future. Uh, you enter the long position by buying shares of the stock and you can close the position by selling the shares you've bought, hopefully after the stock price went up in a period where uh, in which you held your position. So I think that in general, the long, long position is fairly intuitive. It's what most of you imagine when you think of investing in the stock market, but there is another position that you have to understand in investing, the short position. So this one might be a little bit more difficult to understand compared to the long position. So uh, I think it's pretty straightforward though, as, uh, as you get the hang of it. So to start off, you take a short position when you believe that the price of a certain stock will depreciate or go down. Uh, being in a short position is called short selling uh, or shorting. So how do you short a stock? Well, in essence, short selling takes the phrase buy low, sell high, and reverses it. So uh, sell high, buy low. Uh, what does this mean? So how do you sell high when you don't have anything to sell in the first place? Well, you borrow shares from a lender. So for average, for average investors like ourselves, this would be from a broker dealer, a firm in the business of buying and selling assets for its own account or on behalf of its customers. Uh, so if you borrow shares from the broker dealer, then you would have to pay interest on the value of the borrowed shares while you hold your short position. Uh, the next step would be to sell these borrowed shares at the market price. And because you're assuming that the price of the stock price will depreciate in the future, you're selling at what you believe is the high price. So you're short selling a uh, Boeing stock here. And uh, basically you're selling the shares that you borrowed at this higher price. Uh, then hopefully the stock market, uh, the stock price goes down as it did for Boeing during the first few months of the COVID-19 pandemic. And then you have made unrealized gains. And to realize these gains, you have to close your position. So by doing this, um, you buy back, so you do this by buying back the shares you've sold, hopefully at a lower price. This is called buying to cover. Uh, by selling high, then buying low, the difference between the two prices will have generated profit. Uh, then, of course, you return the shares that you've now bought back to the broker dealer. Uh, before you start shorting, though, I think you should know that it's very risky business. Um, the fundamental problem with short selling is the potential for unlimited losses. So when you enter into a long position, the most you can lose is your investment. So if, if you invest like $100 in Domino's stock, then the most you can lose is that $100, um, say if Domino's went insolvent. However, if your uh, potential gain has no limit, um, when you enter into a short position though, your uh, potential losses can be infinite. So you lose more money the higher the stock price rises above the price you initially sold the shares at, and the price raise is theoretically unbounded. So that, could trans that translates basically to unbounded losses for your short position. So you could lose an infinite amount of money. Uh, the takeaway from this is to take heed when you're looking to short a stock, uh, weigh your decision based on the costs and the benefits. And I think, I think that if you do this, then you'll make good investment choices. So um, I guess we're kind of running out of time today. So yeah, just looking at the rankings, um, I think that we might not be able to do it this week, uh, Anna or Ishan, but um, basically what we're, what we're planning on doing is that um, for the top eight, we're just kind of, we're going to reach out to you like earlier on Friday. And um, we're going to say that, um, you know, you can join us on the panel. And at this point, like kind of talk about what you did, what you invested in, and also just kind of your uh, mindset so that we kind of like learn a bit from you guys. But um, I think we're gonna have to postpone it for next week. Sorry, guys. Um, so yeah, that concludes all of our content for this week. Um, this was week two out of three for unit one stock market strategy. Uh, next week, uh, we continue exploring some basic investment strategies. And uh, we'll also touch on a very contentious and interesting idea in finance, the efficient market hypothesis. I'm actually doing research on this. So it's pretty exciting for, for myself. Uh, finally, we're also talking a bit more about um, the complex, the different complex trade orders that you could place in the stock market. So limit and, stock or, uh, limit and stop orders. Uh, so until then, you know, continue playing the stock market game. See how you do if you try to diversify your stocks your, uh, to try to mitigate the idiosyncratic risk. You can, you can also try to search for any potential value or growth stocks. Uh, trying to conduct your own fundamental analysis or growth stock hunting might be a bit difficult at first. It was pretty difficult for me. But um, 
that's what Market Watch is there for. So the site provides tons of new updating information and opinion pieces of the market. Uh, reading through some of them may give you a better sense of how investors talk and the jargon they use. Um, it's all, I also um, oftentimes check the stocks app on my iPhone. Um, if you have an iPhone, I think you would, you would know. Uh, if you click on different stocks on the app, it will pull up relevant news on the stock you're interested in. So like last time, we'll be uploading this meeting's recording onto our YouTube channel. Uh, that way you can refer back to it if you want to recall any information down the line. Uh, the recording for our first meeting is already up there uh, if you want to go and check it out. Um, we're also hoping to make few more, a few more, uh, maybe some more videos on the channel that will take a deeper look into some of the concepts that we may brush over here. So subscribe if you want to be notified notified of our uh, future uploads. Um, feel free to email us if you have any questions, whether it's about the actual content or something else. Uh, last week, we'll also, um, just like last week, uh, we'll also be sending out a feedback form that you can fill out so we know how you guys are feeling about the program and how we can adjust and better accommodate. Um, I do hope that you take the time to do so because your feedback is very valuable to us and we're, all, we're always looking for more ways to better the program. So that's all for um, that's all for today, and I hope that you all have a great weekend. So, until next time, until next time, see you guys.